Cool. Okay. I know you just said that um, we're using the correct mic, but could you double check? Just... I, I know I'm using the correct mic because this is actually silent in the middle, in the gaps here. Okay. When it was on the other one, it was staticky. I will take your I'll take your word for it. Originally, I thought, damn, you know, losing the whole episode that sucks. But now I won't have to um and ah in the middle of what I'm saying because the ideas are more fully formed. But we've left it just long enough. They're completely out of your head. That I've forgotten everything, so uh, everyone will get the original experience of the episode, which is that I have no idea what the fuck I'm saying. Well, the good news is I am a sufficiently competent editor that they won't. Okay, great. Yep. Uh, ooh, eh, Those uh, I'm going to leave in because now you're just being Should we get started then? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant. This is normally a podcast with slides about statistics, but for this episode and the next one, we are continuing our series on mutual aid as a leftist practice, as a political structure, as a personal sense of, I guess, ethics. I mean, I incorporate it into my own sense of ethics, so that's primarily what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, this is episode 2.5, as you may have guessed from my comments. Yes, the lost episode had somewhat unvarnished takes and more than one interesting accent. What? No. I don't know why I'm protesting <laughs> as though immediately people will assume that it's me that's done that. People will assume that it's you that's done that. Oh. Oh, well. Well, I did no suspect accents. I just, like, did some very mean <laughs> comments about our friends. I was the so. one who made all the actual threats. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Actually, but- there's not many really actionable <laughs> threats in these. I'm, I'm actually, I'm usually quite cynical on this show, but this uh, topic is one about which I have much less cynicism, so With- less less actionable threats per threat. <laughs> is, it, is it countable or how, how many actionable threats do you get in a single threat? I think it's more of like a, it's, it's a qualitative. Okay, but you just said more, which is quantitative. No, no. So they could be more better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as in they are more, more actionable push. rather than more threats. Yes, correct. Okay, yeah. okay. Th- th- that I will accept. I mean, that's ordering, so it's not really quantum. I will be a bit more cynical about it next <laughs> week, we talk I a- Well, next month, because I'm not... Uh, next week, I am flat out doing my PhD stuff. Oh, God, no, help absolutely. me. <laughs> Where did we start last time? I thought last episode was pretty good. Where did we- <laughs> Let's get straight to the good stuff. <laughs> so... <laughs> The Absolutely. first thing I want to Let's talk about on. is mutual aid as an alternative to despair and a salve for the death drive. The practice of doing mutual aid works. And uh, for people who are, shall we say, despairing over the state of the world, despairing over their ability to instantiate any change or control over the downward spiral that it appears to be taking, the ability to see meaningful changes right in front of you because you've helped somebody, is it's so heartening and it really does help with the despair that you feel looking at everything else. Yeah, I, I do think that, again, I want to repeat from last episode that was released, that it does feel a little weird to call this mutual aid when fundamentally I think it is just a basic interaction between human beings. Yes, it's a recognition of need and a provision of help. Right, right. And it's just something that comes very naturally. But it, it, can, it is also something that is, if you are a leftist, it is also something that is aligned with your values in a way that um, charity often isn't. And here I'm using charity to refer to the liberal conception of aid, which is always set up to to have caveats and, and structural implementation so that it always reproduces the relationship between the giver and the givee. Mm. It's always tainted by that, fun, by that fundamental assumption that there are deserving and undeserving poor, that there must be some... Transactional um, basis. Some, some transactional basis, and that the underlying logic is that you are helping to help somebody subsist and not necessarily to thrive and i think the point of mutual aid is that you want to take somebody who is in a bad situation and get them out of it where charity is often like oh you're in a bad situation here let me help you continue to survive that yeah which is often you know miserable (laughs) and not fun Uh, on this point that like a lot of the best like practices of mutual aid come with like a broader structure of activism and shit like that for example um my partner is in the sex workers rights activist space and some of the best shit with that during lockdown was being able to get shit out to people in a very broad way scrutinized and politicized so to me the alignment of mutual aid with political ends is very much the third episode in the series. I mean, certainly you experience it as a leftist as something that aligns tightly with your political values, but I don't think the, if you will, individual reward and the individual experience and the individual alignment of morality with practice 
is uh, inherently political. I mean, I think you can do mutual aid in a way that it is not intended to be a political action, but happens to be because it turns out that when you're super alienated and individualized and all interactions are transactional, it is revolutionary to just help somebody because they need it. What I would say that to that, though, is that like if we're drawing distinctions between us and the liberals and liberal charity <laughs> and stuff, a broader movement is kind of like a uh, part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And and in particular, so, so there's different levels at which those distinctions happen. I think on the kind of base level of an, a person-to-person interaction, the lack of expectation of a transactional reciprocity the lack of expectation that somebody will be a deserving poor. It's just a recognition of need. These are very distinct on the level of the particular action to what you see in charity. And then above that, a a structure above something else, if you will, is the political structure around why you do this and what it generates in a community. One of the things I, I talk, or rather, I have talked to a lot of people, older people in particular, about this sort of thing. And if they have lived, like, in small communities where this is just the done thing the idea that this would somehow be novel is kind of strange to them but if you talk to anybody who's lived in like a major city under capitalism worked a lot of jobs these sorts of things rather more embedded in the economy in which we live this is a very different structure to the sorts of things that they are likely to have experienced before so in many respects this is kind of doing mutual aid as a personal experience is much more what people seem to have had in the past when communities existed as a way of sharing resources instead of just maximizing extraction i think one of the reasons that we recently did talk about this with some um some older relatives they were open to the idea but again they they don't didn't necessarily experience it with any sort of recognized political action i think that that's kind of the lived experience because i want to stress when you're doing something that is mutual aid or at least what i do while i do have complex thoughts about its i don't know political implementation and its spiritual connotation and how it affects your ability to to live amidst your alienation when you're actually doing it none of that is present and i think that's what those relatives of uh of ours that we were talking to they did a lot more of what we would label mutual aid, but they just happened to live in a community where it was present, and so they didn't experience it as anything other than this is how you help people live in a community. Somebody yeah. needs something, and that's how we experienced it when we had somebody who needed to stay uh, at our place because they didn't have accommodation in Australia. Uh, when they just sort of decided to come here, it's like, yeah, come over here. We just thought this will be fun, and you know, you recognize, oh, this this might be classify as that, but the experience of it is just somebody needs help. We've got a spare couch. That's it's mm-hmm. easy, and then I hide in the computer room i will say though i am from one of those country towns and those places are fucking surveillance states for any like romanticism about it there comes like a harsh moralism with it as well like so i'm not talking about the kind of country towns that you come from i'm talking about like explicit sort of more commune communities in this we were talking like um uh like a church parish that's quite tightly bound was was the one that we were talking about without the religious connotations though yeah yeah the, it was a church parish as a as a community yeah. as that was the nominal label in the same way that some of the communities we're in have nominal labels but are yeah it was more people who live around the church the person involved didn't actually go to it yeah yeah but you, yeah yes but but yes yeah. so that there are uh shall we say less uh surveilled or perhaps less moralistic communities in which this does actually work i find that as soon as you attach moralism to it you wind up with the idea of who deserves help and that completely undermines the underlying principles here yeah i, I would say that is true i would go back to it and say that as much as we don't as we said in the last episode police who and who and who isn't deserving we would not necessarily give aid to a nazi yeah there is not a there's not a it's not entirely unconditional no i would say that it is a social contract whereby you don't necessarily expect somebody to pay you back directly but you expect them to treat you with the same level of humanity as you are treating them. Yeah, exactly. Which, and I mean, Nazism and fascism fundamentally breaks that social contract. Well, yeah, it's, it's you renounce your own humanity. Yeah. Uh, and it's good, actually, if you're in that framework. <laughs> but that's what we're sort of talking in this episode about, is that when you do this, you feel good. Yeah. Uh, and you get to do something that is lefty. And, and how often do you get to fucking do that? Not and you often. get to do something that is very, very obviously and directly impactful in somebody else's life. I would just push back against that a little bit, just in terms of like the person 
person I've known in my life the most who was the closest aligned to actual fascism. And like, I am from a small country town and went to posh private school. So I have like plenty of experience around that sort of thing. But (laughs) the person I've met in my life who real rough shit was telling me about like Judeo Bolshevism and that kind of shit Mm. was also like very into the idea of like community service and like helping each other out and like kind of making fun of me for being alienated from my neighbors in a city and that kind of shit. Well, so I would ask of that person who counts, right? Who's in the in group? No, no, of course. Like, that is the... Yeah. No, I, I get you. Like, there's very much a sense of fascists pining for a community and, like, a relationship and sort of an idyllic vision. But as you say, it's always couched in the terms of service and couched in the terms of sacrifice towards that. And I think that the underlying logic will is always going to pervert that ideal into yeah. a death drive. I think that if that person got their way very quickly, that would dis- disintegrate just because that's the logic of what they're... It's more about like, why don't we have communities anymore? It's because of this outgroup is the prevailing logic. Yes. Right. And certainly, like, if you listening to this, even if you're not necessarily a leftist, you don't have to do this because you have less leftist morality or leftist ethics or whatever else. You can simply have an ethics that says people who need stuff to live should have access to that stuff. Give it a go. You might find that it's really nice because I find that when I talk to people, if it comes up about mutual aid and the stuff that we've contributed to and the stuff that you help manage, that um, I find that a lot of people get turned off from the idea of helping others because their only experience of it is liberal charity and- or conditional aid. And all conditional aid, which I would say that liberal charities always are. And we, we're all liberals, to be to be clear. <laughs> I'll steal that from Bart in the previous episode who clarified that rather saliently. It will never but, be released. Yeah, we're, we're all liberals, but at the same time, it's nice to be able to do something that isn't as... Transactional? It, that isn't as built in that, those sort of structural terms. And you get to do something that is leftist. But also, I would argue, and I would argue this is about a lot of leftist political formations and ideas, is more human. Mm. Uh, and I think that because it is so, it is far less caught up in the bullsh- in the bullshit of a system which is alienating and inhuman, you can experience some humanity and connection, which, hey, uh, that's pretty good for people. <laughs> yeah. I have a professional relationship with an Islamic school. I want to talk less about my job on the podcast just in case someone finds it, but um, they have like tins out for like Gaza relief at the moment, which is like a charity in the traditional liberal sense of the word. But at the same time, like I think there is like a community thing in like putting a tenor in the in the Gaza tin. Like I don't think that's- It's uh, not as though these things don't have some, some help, but I think that we would, uh, all of us here would much rather for just direct aid than for the only way to get any help to Gaza to be charity right Sure, now. absolutely. And honestly, like, the best thing to do would be just to cut off all Western aid of the Israeli government. Yeah, we could send no money to Gaza and just no money to Israel, and that would be a huge fucking net yeah, win absolutely. <laughs> to, uh, to the Gazans. Yeah. So. I do want to talk a bit more about the kind of... What, what Dean was saying about the fundamental human experience of helping people, because I do genuinely believe that if evolutionary psychology people had any goddamn idea what they were doing, they would have much more radical ideas around the role of community and the role of assistance towards other people than their kind of inherently hierarchically biased theories tend to indicate. It's a little strange when you hear evolutionary psychologists talk about, you know, as we evolved on the planes and so forth, but they're always talking about an individual human in a situation. Yes. And not, you know, apes together strong. We're a social species, right? We have evolved not only to respond positively to positive social interactions as kind of a biological mechanism, hugging people gives you endorphins after all, almost universally, but we have developed kind of pro-social behaviours and an experience of morality that kind of corresponds to that. It doesn't matter what philosophical or religious tradition you look at. The underlying ideas of what bad stuff is tends to be stuff that is asocial or antisocial, or in some ways doing harm to other people. Yeah, like sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the main differences tend to be, like, who counts as a person on the other end, and what does it mean to do harm? And We're still talking about (laughs) Sodom? Maybe later, dear. (laughs) But, but like, fundamentally here, you have an underlying principle, and you come to the golden rule, right, with this, treat others how you want to be treated, that sort of thing, is pretty common amongst different ethical systems, even if there's a whole lot of other shit piled on top of that. Yeah, treat others as you want to be treated, I guess, but also just treat others as you'd like them to be, to help you, again, against a tiger yes 
or treat <laughs> others because it's nice when they produce goods and food in your little community. Be kind to others because you also were birthed as an absolutely useless little pink <laughs> shit and had to be... Scribbler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you want to talk about evolutionary psychology, the fact that we, as a species, are born completely fucking useless as compared to a deer, which is up and about, you know, quick as you like. It's, I, I, I <laughs> no, we, we nobody, discussed... was, nobody is born pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps, yeah. Right, exactly. And, it, and in fact, we oftentimes, a woman giving birth, or sorry, someone giving birth needs another person to help pull the fucking bootstraps on the baby to get them out. Like, <laughs> even that relationship of the of infant to, to parent is often has a third person you know to yeah because yeah. it's a hell of an ordeal yeah to assist them with it and how do you think we evolved to have such a huge fucking head on a baby yeah without that without the ability to assist one another in the actual process of birthing well, okay as much as like the way i'm phrasing this might be wrong it might be sort of marxist progressionism or whatever but like in terms of like pre-agricultural society those things ran on gift economies because you had like no secure like period of when you would have food and shit so it would have to be shared yeah. because like yeah no way of preserving stuff either really absolutely yeah yeah there are phrases from uh societies like uh the best place to store food is in your buddy's belly because mm. Mm. the entire thing of it was that like you can't store food the fundamental idea that not only is it avoiding waste but it's also a pro-social behavior right because you yeah, and your mate absolutely. both get to eat then and then presumably there might be more later on that would not otherwise be available as i said in the last episode the guy who invented the term mutual aid is uh peter Kropotkin, who was a scientist who like was really into like studying cooperative behaviors amongst species and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's always so funny to me because because I am doing research in a biology school, right? And you see a lot of discussion of like competition mechanisms and things like that. So intra species competition within a species for like reproduction and food and all this sort of thing. Social species break these models. In the most extreme cases, you get stuff like ants and bees and termites and these things which are colony species yeah. where basically one or a very very small number in the population actually are reproducing and everybody else is basically there to support that kind of reproductive structure. I mean, in, in humans, you don't see it so much because the proportion of people who are able to reproduce is much higher. But what you see instead are communities where people who are not actively reproducing at the time support the people who do. Yeah. Until that gets broken by everybody having to fucking work all yeah, the yeah. time, including the pregnant people. And I will say about Kropotkin, the same thing I said last time, which is I do not like any agrarian anarchist from a aristocratic background. <laughs> like I, you don't trust them. I don't trust that. I don't like it. I think that their fear of the industrial proletarian is much more outweighs their like... And their fear of taking a goddamn shower. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you out. All anarchists. Oh, another... It's called soap! <laughs> I don't know. I was a stinky anarchist back in the day. Let's not let's not go uh, too harsh. Okay, 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 okay. But you haven't refuted my claim, and that's the important. Thing. Another thing I want to I want to mention with regards to this, and this is particularly me sticking both fingers up at the uh, hobs of the world who believe that you know the state of nature is an inhuman is you know one where everybody's fighting over scraps and that sort of thing. The state of nature for humans is to cooperate. If you're in a dark forest. And no one else is around, but then you see another person. My first thought would be, thank fuck there's two of us. We could potentially work this problem out. Even if we don't speak the same language, you see in disasters networks of cooperations between of cooperation between people that arise organically because there is a recognition of shared need. But also the fact that me alone, probably dead. Me and somebody else much higher probability of surviving because we can pool our resources, we can pool our labor, we can help each other. And in, in many respects, it is true that, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, particularly when those parts are individuals trying to survive on their own. Yeah, and this goes to why we're doing this episode and making a distinction between this practice as being just good for you as a leftist and then it being good as a political action. I keep hammering on this. My role on the episode is just to repeat trite, stupid statements and whatnot, but I'm going to do it again. Doing this is just 
just very basically good for people and for communities. Where good in this context means it reinforces the existence of those communities. It supports the people within it. And, you know, it's... it's an it makes ex- hungry people not hungry. Yes. And it, ha- it works and it happens to align with all of that and leftist values. And again, I'd argue that it, that's no, no, no coincidence. Yeah. Uh, and it's... um. Well, please cut out all these ums and ahs. <laughs> and you don't need to think about any of that when you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. We are obviously like neurotic people, but obviously the best case of it is to relieve some of that neurosis and not to add to it. <laughs> Listen, I take uh, anti-anxiety <laughs> drugs for a reason, but I also help people because that works as well. One other thing that I really want to emphasize, and, and I think this comes up any time you talk to people who have experienced a community where this is the norm, is that it takes a lot of alienation to get people to give up on these kinds of pro-social behavior. It takes a lot of alienation to enforce transactional ideas around assistance. Boy, do we see that under capitalism. And another thing we see is that the kind of individualizing ideology of capitalism, which attempts to enforce competition between individuals, is an attempt, consciously or not, to break those bonds of mutual assistance and mutual dependence, or to disguise the bonds of mutual dependence, in favour of kind of, well, I guess, zero-sum thinking, where in any given interaction, and in any given transaction, in particular if you're thinking about it in this way, somebody wins, quote-unquote, and somebody loses, right? Well, Somebody gains and somebody has a loss. Well, in the liberal ideology, they would say that the the existence overall is that there's a net benefit to everyone through the existence of these transactions, you know, as a tide that lifts all boats, etc. Anyone drowning is, um, it's their fault. Um, (laughs) But, I mean, this goes to what I spoke about right at the, towards the start of the episode, which is that when you have a a liberal formation of charity, it always reinforces those existing dynamics. And that, I'll I'll actually put some, uh, some meat behind that, which is stuff like most charities, we have the ability to to deduct charitable donations from your tax, for example. Mm. On the face of it sounds, okay, that's pretty good. That encourages people to give. But it also means that unless you're somebody who pays taxes, you can't benefit from this. So your charity as as somebody in poverty which is most often just direct aid because that's the only option available to you, you don't get any societal reinforcement of that. The existence of not-for-profits are all structured in such a way that requires the continued existence of the not-for-profit. So you have to be able to show to the people donating to you like a return, which means that you can't necessarily give unconditionally. You always have to... The structures of these uh, liberal formations of aid are self-reinforcing in the same way that all of a society's superstructure is self-reinforcing. But it's it's very plain to see as if you start to look into how charities are, are formed in a liberal context, the way that the only permitted forms of helping another person or the only supported forms of helping another person are ones in which you are sustaining them in their present position. It's never redistributing. Yeah. And I think that that is, is very telling and why it is so antithetical to uh, this idea of mutual aid. And again, if I might, so Tess really wants to say something, but I'm going to, I'm going to butt in. <laughs> if, if my premise that mutual aid is just more fundamentally human is true, then what I'm additionally saying here is that if you've never get to do any, then all of the aid you ever get to participate in is fundamentally tainted by something that is inhumane. And then it feels fucky. And then you feel bad all the time. And then you f- feel a sort of guilt. Like, am I not, oh, I'm not uh, giving $5 a month to so-and-so charity, which certainly would, would help people but it, it's always alienated. That alienation means that you aren't experiencing any of the actual, or you're experiencing so much less of what it is to live at, live as a human amongst a community of humans. So I think that it's, I have a bunch of things to say because you kept talking. I kept coming up with new ones, right? So oh, the first so one I. is that... <laughs> well, I'll shut up. You guys, you, guys have, you guys can have a turn. I'll allow okay. it. So, so the first one is that there are different ways of charities existing. In the ideal scenario... It's an organization that is intended to provide material support, whether that is food or a service or whatever. It is intended to help people. And the the kind of organizational structure, even if it doesn't necessarily change the underlying structures, is a way within capitalism of taking money from the good-hearted people who have a bit and using that money to help other people. I'm not saying that's bad. No, no, no. But it's, it, it's, it is not challenging the underlying structures, for one. But it is also, that is exactly the same structure legally and politically that allows for the mass laundering of both reputations and money, really, by very wealthy people who will set up their own charities and their own non-profits, usually to advance their own ideological or political ends. 
funnel money into it as a tax break and maybe give their failed children somewhere to go and be director of for half a billion dollars a year sort of thing. Bill Gates, and it's always dangerous when you start talking about Bill Gates. Nah, of course, that can't it's actionable here. threats time! <laughs> <laughs> I may have to beep that one. Fair enough. It. I want this whole section to be beeps. Bill Gates should be <laughs> No, I think unit is fine because that would have to go through the legal system, but he has committed the crimes that <laughs> is necessary that you would want to make. <laughs> but like, fundamentally, the Gates Foundation has been a decades-long effort to launder and whitewash his reputation. But in, in doing so, it has advanced a lot of his um, eugenicist ideas, but also his material position as well, because it has enabled the kind of distribution of Microsoft products in poor areas as like educational material, which of course means that those people are now more familiar with Microsoft products than their competitors. That counts more responsible for fucking patents being on COVID vaccines. He has millions of corpses around the world right now. Like it's real bad. No, if, if there's a hell, they've got a they've got a level sp- special just for fucking him, <laughs> uh, not just for inventing computers, which I fucking hate. Um, <laughs> I will also say that if you want to build the institutions of working class solidarity, you got to take whatever advantage you can get. So the Australian Unemployed Workers Union is a registered charity. Get that back. Yes. Yeah, I suppose I would say that... This is I'm a not legal framework that... that is not the same as operating as a liberal charity. And I would say that it's not that I hate charity. It's just that my criticism is that even when it's not malicious like Bill Gates, it is always reinforcing these sort of inhuman relations. It's always reinforcing the existing relations of class. Again, I'm just to use trite statements but what a good thing about mutual aid don't do that (laughs) cannot do that for once yes because oftentimes you're forced to do it like in the case of the very just cause of the unemployed workers union so another way of kind of distinguishing between the existing structures for doing things like charity and um, mutual aid is that mutual aid is actually effective altruism as opposed to the whining piss baby rich people who want to use effective altruism as a cover for their own hoarding of wealth there is a level of utilitarianism to uh, mutual aid in the sense that there is a recognition of I have something this person needs and I will give it to them but there's a recognition that this is constrained by proximity so I can give somebody who lives near me some money or some help I cannot give somebody in Gaza some help directly and this is one of the the distinctions here is that I am not going to paralyze myself worrying if I am maximizing the quote-unquote utility of my money or my effort or whatever because if there's somebody standing right there who needs my help and I can give it to them the time that I would spend ang- anxiety collapsing over my maximizing of the efficiency of my help could be spent helping that person this is something that mutual aid does so much better than any of the bullshit wankery out of effective altruism because it just says the person is there I can do this now and then go off and do other things that will potentially help other people I agree but I do want to give a shout out recently did some actual reading on effective altruism and that very much seems to be to be a a movement or a, or a philosophy that was hijacked because it happened to align with the it happened to excuse massive assholes being massive assholes I don't think it's it's unreasonable to take the point that you want to be you want to do the most good that you can Yes. With your, and I suppose that you can apply that, that principle constructively in many situations, but certainly the, the bullshit, like Sam bank run fraud and. Well, I mean, even. Scam look, bank run fraud. Uh, hey, yeah. got him. People like Peter Singer. I mean, Peter Singer is one of the main theorists of effective altruism and is a deeply depraved individual who is a eugenicist and extremely racist and has somehow managed to think himself into a position of just the most fascist bullshit imaginable. Yeah, these people exist to, as fascism is just liberalism when it gets hungry, Yeah, and these people exist to provide the, the framework as to how that can happen without a massive conflict of internal values. These people are just one step ahead in the logic of the internalization of uh, imperial cruelty, uh, but they're too dumb to realize that they're also going to be uh, up against the fucking wall because I know, they're I, nerds. I, I, <laughs> I, I reckon Peter Singer would be kept around as a pet. He's great for making these cunts feel better about themselves. But fundamentally, right? Right? The the idea of effective altruism here is that mutual aid fucking works. 
it helps people. It changes their material conditions very directly and more or less immediately as soon as they are able to get the assistance that they need, which is something that I think uh, the experience of doing this really is... I hesitate to use the word revelatory, but when you are so used to losing politically, so used to losing, so used to watching bad shit happen that you have no ability to counteract or control or fight against, to be able to just see some good that happens as a result of your actions, it does feel like a genuine beam of light in the darkness. And it is, it's affirming, it's nice to see that when you are able to do something in accordance with your values... It um, works. It works. It's nice. I suppose that really is this episode could be five seconds long, which is <laughs> do mutual aid. It makes you feel good, and you get to actually feel left for once. Oftentimes, you don't. If there was ever a time to do some fucking praxis, it's mutual aid. It's the like- one last thing I will say, and this is an argument that I really love to do, in the same way that um, proving Hobbes wrong is a great delight to me. If you meet some dipshit right wing, typically who is obsessed with Kant moral philosophy because they're a Kant, you can use mutual aid as a wonderful counterexample to their all of their ideas that are usually centered around morality means I don't tell you what to do and you don't tell me what to do and that's freedom because their idea of actually let me backtrack for a second Kant's moral philosophy is centered around what he called the universal imperative which is about as wanky as it gets and it's basically his abstracted version of the golden rule the simple version is treat other people how you want to be treated the wanky version is behave in a manner in accordance with principles that you desire to be universal. Until Marx came along, all those European philosophers, useless assholes. (laughs) I think Kant was a contemporary of Marx. Kant was before Marx. Come on. I don't do years. I'm not a historian, okay? These are numbers over three. I don't deal with them. The the fundamental idea here is that the, the notion that conservatives have of what that universal imperative means is one of what we might call negative freedom. It is the toddler's understanding, which is, I don't tell you what to do, you don't tell me what to do, and that somehow makes society work. Whereas if you have a a deeper understanding of this idea, it actually works out much better to apply principles of mutual aid in the desire that they would be universal. Because it would actually be great for me to get help if I need it, therefore I should help other people when they need it. That's a fantastic universal rule to use. Yeah, and they yeah. hate it so much. When the first time we recorded this episode, I went on a big tangent about Kantian moral philosophy and uh, an alternative reading of his um, priorities and whatnot. But I'll, I'll slim it down for the benefit of, of you two and for the listener. Thank God. And, uh, and <laughs> I stand by that I was right. However, I'll stick to a, uh, a much more cut down The version. Cliff Notes version, yes. Exactly. Which is that Tess mentioned Hobbes earlier. If you aren't familiar with um, Hobbes, he's a very uh, important writer in early philosophy in general, but specifically conservative philosophy. And you may have heard the famous phrase of his, nasty, brutish, and short, which is what he says life would be like without the existence of a um, authoritarian state. That's a cut down. The actual version of the quote is poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And it's worth keeping that in mind when people use Hobbes to justify means testing, to justify the structures that put people in positions of vulnerability and keep them there, that they're often ignoring the ideology is disguising their underlying assumption that people when left to their own devices will fall apart will uh, not be able to sustain human life there must be some imposed hierarchy the hierarchy that uh, liberals and modern conservatives alike are so enamored of but as we've talked about this entire episode the fact is is that people don't become poor and solitary in an unstructured world all you have to do to see that is look at what happens after natural disasters exactly they do become if they're anarchists unwashed but that <laughs> what do you is... mean become if they're anarchists they're already unwashed <laughs> that's uh, but that is acceptable and <laughs> it's it's worth keeping in mind when you're looking at Hobbes and when you're looking at Kant who's sort of talking is who's more of a philosophy is very much based on f- fundamental assumptions that Hobbes outlays that Kant wanted to be a mathematician but couldn't get his head around the symbols at the end of the day it's all premised on the idea that if the hierarchy isn't maintained if the charity isn't means tested if the undeserving are even given aid then society will collapse and I will say to that a good <laughs> um, and B, no, that's not that's not what happens. And it's fundamentally that that misconception about the way humans work is why so much of conservatism is fucking wrong. This that is, was the short version. That listening. was the short version. With regards to that, I'll say that there, the people, if you will, in the middle of the power structure, think about it like that. People at the top of the power structure 
only are fundamentally interested in maintaining their own positions, and they are rather more mask off about the 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 intent of keeping the underclass under. Yeah, the people with capital are often far more conscious. Marxist. They, they, they're class conscious. They, yeah, yeah. they absolutely have that understanding of that. Even if it's not outwardly scheming, they're certainly aware of their interests. And Well, no, you don't have to outwardly scheme if you have class solidarity and shared interests, and you know about that. Right, but I'm, I'm just saying that they have their own ideology that would mask that in terms of like what they literally do. It's called conservatism and, and yeah. liberalism in the way that it says that what I'm doing is actually natural and moral and, and true, etc. I understand what you mean, though, because it is why the Financial Times is a better paper than the Guardian or the New York Times, just because <laughs> they're not trying to sell an ideology. They're trying to sell papers to a particular ruling class clique. Well, who actually know, have an understanding of the structure, yeah, and are willing to and pay for it. those people want to actually know what their business is doing. <laughs> yes. So uh, Dean has run away i assume in terror at the idea of continuing this episode anymore so uh thank you dear listener for tuning in once again i hope this is useful to you and keep up to date for the next one next month about the politics more politics of mutual aid thank you i think that's about it listener (laughs) oh my god tune in next time for bart versus tess goodbye bart thank you for coming Dear listener, please do me a favor and follow me on Letterbox. I'm at Snitch and All Well there. Oh, and join the Patreon. And, uh... <laughs> join the Patreon, pay us money. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do mutual aid to Bart through the institution of Patreon. When I was making absolutely. a sandwich, is that the end of the episode?